let's talk about Ruby instead, because after all, we all came here for Ruby. And some of you, unfortunately, came here for technical Ruby content. And I will continue the tradition of me presenting literally every time we have a meetup. And next time, I'm going to bring you some deeply technical content on Ruby. And Idiosyncrasies of Ruby is a talk that I gave called Weird Ruby at a conference called Keep Ruby Weird. And it's fantastic, if I do say so myself. It's about some idiosyncrasies of Ruby. Today, we're not talking about that. Because today, we're going to talk about how we, as a community, are going to continue to grow and develop the Ruby language. Right? So I want to talk to you about the Ruby Association. Is anyone familiar with the Ruby Association? It's an organization in Japan. This is the mothership. The Ruby Association is the nonprofit in Japan that assists with the development of the language itself. They do things like offer up the Ruby Prize. Has anyone ever heard of the Ruby Prize? It's a prize for $10,000 for a developer who makes a significant contribution to Ruby. And every year it's won by a Japanese person because Americans, we don't so much make significant, sorry Aaron and, and Dr. Brain and all of the other American Rubyists who contribute greatly to the language. But as, as a comparison between the American and Japanese Ruby communities, we contribute almost none back to this language itself. Almost none. And the Ruby Association is the nonprofit that exists in Japan to keep the language growing and keep it alive. And they do things like they put up $10,000 for this Ruby prize. And uh, the other day, I had the pleasure of hosting one of the Ruby committers in my home. They come to visit me occasionally because I speak uh, Japanese. By the way, Scott brought up uh, the difference between efficiency and effectiveness. Those two words share two out of three kanji in Japanese. Um, so this yo, so this yo, and and the um, other uh, word that I wanted to share was actually exactly me, which is called tsundoku. Tsundoku is the word for book collector in Japan. It's the person who has a literal stack of books this high on their dresser. That's me right now at home. I have a stack of books like this. I've got forty more loaded in my little Kindle. I travel around the world with, and and I don't read any of them, because instead I organize things like this. They do sometimes, they really do. Hoarding books sparks joy, much like hoarding magic cards. If anyone has any magic cards for sale, I'm, I'm your guy. Um, so I don't remember what we were talking about. It was the Ruby Association, yeah, that's right. The Ruby Association, I had one of these guests, a guy named Yana, he wrote the new version of IRB. And some of you have used IRB. And um, Yana came to my home. Yana has worked on Ruby for maybe four or five years. He's a software consultant. The sum total of all the money that this language has made him is maybe about $24,000. I would guess that every single one of us in the past four years has made more than $24,000 on Ruby. And these are the people who are building the language, right? They're the ones doing the work. In the American Ruby software community, we made a couple billion dollars off this language that they built for us. So this is a story about how we're going to pay it forward as a group, okay? I'm on the board of a nonprofit called Ruby Together. Has anyone ever heard of Ruby Together? Mm, a couple of you, probably because of me. Probably because we're not great at marketing either. We made this really freaking cute sticker. Who would not put that sticker all over themselves? It's adorable, right? I really want a Ruby Together t-shirt. Ruby Together is an organization that takes donations from individual contributors as well as companies. So individual developers sign up to give us five bucks a month. And we take that money and we pay it forward to the next generation of open source developers. So. Our organization, over the last year, uh, hired, I think, 16 different people to pair program on open source projects. We hired uh, half early career developers and half experienced developers, and we paired them together and had them pair on open source projects. And the idea that we have in paying each of these people $75 an hour to work on open source with your money, after you give it to us, for $5 a month, is to get them to see the next generation of open source projects. That's the kind of project that, that Ruby Together works on. We also fund the development of Bundler and the development of Ruby Gems. We hire consultants full time to go and work on open source projects that matter. Because I would bet that someone in this last week has run Bundle install. <coughs> has anyone here bundled any gems in the last week? Those, those depend on two very important projects. Uh, and I don't want to claim by any stretch of the imagination that Ruby Together is the only reason those exist, but we're helping. We're trying real hard to help. And people giving money to Ruby Together helps. Ruby Together, though, has a little bit of a complicated past. If you all are familiar with rubydrama.com, did anyone remember that website? 
this is a thing. The Ruby community is known for drama like this, like that. Was anyone in like the drama club in high school? There was a lot of that going on. And the thing is that we don't really do that anymore as a community. Ruby, rubydrama.com, use the parlance of our times, was canceled. We decided as a community that we're not about that, right? That we're about focusing on growing the community and embracing newcomers. And I wholeheartedly embrace that idea. I think it's really important that the people who are coming into the Ruby community today, they get the same welcome that I had when I came. Because I showed up in this boot camp and people were like, here's the road. Follow the road and you're going to be good. And today, I can, I can barely write code without writing a test first. Honestly. Like, it's confusing to me. I lose track of things very quickly. I learned, I think, and this is probably because I'm a fan of test driven development. I learned, I think, the right way first. I think that opinionated software development is a smart idea. I think some of the people who've been in the Ruby community for a long time have had the right idea about how to build software. And I think that unjustly, to some degree, uh, the Ruby community has kind of suffered at the hands of the wider software community. So uh, Ruby Central is another nonprofit organization. Anyone heard of Ruby Central? Yeah? There's RubyConf and there's RailsConf. You've heard of those things? Those are both organized by Ruby Central. This is the oldest nonprofit in the Ruby community, aside from the Ruby Association. I think the Ruby Association predates Ruby Central, but Ruby Central was founded by Chad Fowler and a couple other people at one of the very first organizations of Rubyists in the nation in Florida, I believe. And Ruby Central for a long time has existed organizing all of these conferences, and that's pretty much exclusively their, their directive in the world. They make conferences, right? They do support Ruby Gems. So, so part of um, the team that works on Ruby Gems, yeah, there's, there's this gentleman named Evan Phoenix, right? And Ruby Gems and Evan Phoenix work very hard, or I'm sorry, Ruby Central and, and um, Evan Phoenix work very hard on Ruby, uh, Ruby Gems. So the, the part earlier where I said that we are not solely responsible for Ruby Gems, this is not a thing. We contribute in a small way. Uh, Ruby Central pays bills. They engage sponsors like Fastly who allows us to actually download all these gems. Uh, this is a wonderful thing for the world, right? The work that these organizations do to keep the infrastructure that allows Ruby to even be a language online. I don't know how I would begin uh, if Ruby Central disappeared tomorrow and also Bundler. Like, I don't, I don't know how I would start to do that thing. Many of you are better programmers than, than I am, and you would figure that out real quick, right? Uh, maintaining a local gem cache and, and there's like a gem box thing where you can have your own local gems. Things like that are, are valuable, right? And you should probably do those if you're at a company that depends on having uptime, right? Uh, just in case Ruby Gems ever goes down. But, but these people allow me to have a job. And I bought a house recently and I bought my wife a, a new old car for Christmas and I put a big bow on it. It was the same car that I used to come home with when I was a car salesman. So I actually stopped selling cars in like 2000 and I want to say 2008. Yeah. And so I, I uh, just recently bought my wife, I think, a 2009 Honda Odyssey. The car's 11 years old. But it was a big deal to me because I used to drive that car home from the car dealership on my brakes to show my wife. Like, I can't express to you what it means. This language to me. Fuck everything about this. I'm so sorry. Okay. I'm regaining my composure. This shit matters. All right. Ruby matters. Ruby changed my life. Let's talk about Node instead, because I can talk about Node without crying about it. <laughs> I cry. I know, right? Who doesn't want to cry when they think of Node? Um, Node, the Node.js foundation, was a foundation created by some programmers who wrote uh, JavaScript and wrote Node and founded a corporation about it. And that corporation, I think, at some point went off the rails ethically. Um, from my personal perspective, I think that the, the Node.js foundation and Node as a company and as a trademark and all of the complications that come from that ethically uh, 
kind of ran into some difficult waters at some point. It turns out that in the United States of America, corporations are people, uh, except they're people without uh, ethics uh, or, or emotion, right? That we're legally considering all corporations people, but, that, but they can't feel or empathize, and that's called a middle schooler, and it's also called a sociopath. Um, and I don't mean to say that the Toad Foundation was formed out of sociopaths, uh, but, but I do think that there's something uh, that gets evil about owning a thing, like what we're creating, right? Then there was the JS Foundation. This was founded by the CNCF. Does anyone know what the CNCF is? You've heard of this, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So people come up with open source projects, famous open source projects, and they donate the trademarks of those projects to the CNCF. So Prometheus, for example, uh, if any of you are operating a Kubernetes cluster, you've probably heard this word. It's a fantastic monitoring tool uh, for a bunch of apps out there in the world. So you can set up Prometheus and have it pull a whole list of applications every five minutes or whatever and, and hit a like a slash metrics endpoint, whatever you set up, right? You got a bunch of Rails apps over here and a bunch of Django apps and some Node apps over here and you hit the slash metrics endpoint and Prometheus is like, give me the payload. And you hand it the payload and then it just like puts it in a pile and you can run all kinds of analytics data on it, right? So it allows you to do a bunch of monitoring stuff you wouldn't otherwise be able to do. It's a fantastic open source project. It's hugely popular in the Kubernetes community. And the, the creators of Prometheus, they gave the trademark of Prometheus to the CNCF. And what that prevents is a future in which Darth Bezos sells Prometheus by Amazon as a service. That's not a thing that Prometheus can ever be because they can't ever put the name Prometheus on any of their products. So the next time they want to steal the work of a couple thousand developers, they actually can't brand it as their own thing. So the CNCF is a foundation that protects open source long term. And they founded the JS Foundation and recently, they together, the Node.js Foundation and the JS Foundation came together to form the OpenJS Foundation. The OpenJS Foundation was this unified effort to promote the growth and development of the JavaScript language to move forward into the future as an entire language community together, right? The Ruby community has three distinct nonprofits that I just detailed for you, and they are not unified under a single banner. JavaScript beat us to the punch in getting over their drama and unifying to OpenJS. I'm not okay with that as a Rubyist. I feel like we can figure that out a little bit faster. So what I am proposing today um, is something a little bit more like the Python Software Foundation. So the Python Software Foundation was founded here in Beaverton. And the Python Software Foundation made $3 million in revenue last year. Here's a little zoom in on the $3 million None of the open source foundations for Ruby made that much money. In fact, all of us combined made less than one fifth of that money. All of us together. And the reasons include that occasionally companies like Google and Microsoft come along and say, hey, we've got this million dollar check. Where should it land? Because we like Ruby, we like JavaScript, we like Python. Where does this million dollars go? that we made off the backs of your language and your open source developers. And in the Ruby community, sometimes we go like this. We're like, ah, I don't really know like where I'm prepared to take money. Shipping money overseas to Japan to the Ruby Association is difficult. It's hard. But you know who can figure that out is lawyers. And we can hire lawyers to just like do work for us for money. And it turns out that we have money because we're software developers. We don't have like a whole pile of money, right? We're Portland software developers, but we have enough money, right? <laughs> We certainly all have like five bucks a month to throw down on a thing and I don't even want your money today. I'm not trying to get you to go and sign up for Ruby together. I'm trying to give you to give me 10 minutes of your time. And I had assumed that we would be talking to 60 people today because I had 60 RSVPs. Half those people didn't even show up even though they were RSVP'd. I'm going to be shaming them all each individually on Twitter later. You should watch my Twitter feed and be like, Jeff, you asshole. And then you can all tweet like, yeah, Jeff, screw, no, please don't do that. I'm sure things come up, right? Yeah, yeah, it's all in the video here. Uh, sorry, Jeff. No, the, the thing is like we have 32 attendees today, which is kind of killing it because last month, some of you were there. How many do we have? Like a dozen, a little bit more, 14 people? We, we more than doubled our attendance this month. Uh, and, and we're gonna double that attendance again. And I'm gonna ask your help 
for, for something for next time, right? Next month, we're going to have 100 people at this meetup. And that means that every single one of you needs to bring two friends. That's actually kind of an easy ask, right? I, I have several hundred friends in the Ruby community. I can absolutely browbeat a couple of them into spending an evening with me and eating some free pizza and drinking some beer. It's easy, right? Tell them like afterwards you'll, you'll take them out to play Magic the Gathering or something. They'll come, okay? That's, maybe, that's my ploy, actually. If anyone wants to play Magic afterwards, I've got my decks right here in my backpack. So um, the, the point is that like, this is kind of a problem here. This, this graph stuff that keeps showing up on the internet. I'm sure some of you have seen this. These are the top 10 languages ranked uh, by, by repos created on GitHub. You can see at the top here that JavaScript is kind of holding steady at giant monster domination of all other languages because JavaScript's the only one that runs in the browser and browsers rule the world, right? So we got JavaScript up top, it's kind of trending downward and where it's trending downward, you can see TypeScript at the bottom ticking upward and then we have Python, which is more or less flat because a scientist learns a Python to measure the throughput of their jet engine, whatever it is. I've actually gone to conferences, it's really interesting, the Python community, you've got like half the room over here and they're like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm actually digesting a petabyte of information a second on a, on a jet engine as I shoot a laser through it. I'm measuring the efficiency of the gas burning in a jet engine. And then you got this other person who's like, I make websites. And they're like in the same room. It's like chilling, you know? Very interesting community, right? Uh, and then you got Java and they're like, we're still here, we count, right? And it goes on and on and on and on and on. And then if you click on that little more thing at the bottom, right? There's Ruby. Wow. Wow, Ruby. What is up? Anyone have any hypotheses as to what may be leading to the absolute total death of Ruby? It's just one metric. You know what this graph measures? This measures the number of repos created in a given language on GitHub. That's what this person is, is measuring. They're measuring the number of repos created on GitHub by lines. So for example, if I generate a new Rails app, right? And that Rails app includes some number of lines of Ruby. It also includes a node modules directory nowadays, doesn't it? Yeah, Rails is a JavaScript app. Cause node modules is huge. My God, I have to ignore it every time I try and grab through any file directory. What even are you doing? You have like a whole module to remove just the spaces? Yeah, like, click the disclosure triangle on node modules when you're waiting for like... Oh gosh. I mean, I have to ignore it. Like, what was the thing that brought down node reason? It was like L space. There was just like a whole package, like several thousand lines of code to just consistently remove the spaces from a string in JavaScript. And it brought down like half of all the node apps in the world. So, um, the reality is like we all got some JavaScript up in our business. JavaScript is winning, but this is not an accurate metric at all of how the Ruby community is doing. What that is is a reflection of the maturity of the Ruby community. Because I would guess that not many people in this last year have been like, oh, this is an API that definitely needs a new Ruby gem. I'm gonna write this Ruby gem. No, because when you went to Google that app and this Ruby gem, then it was there. And there were probably like five copies of it. And one of them had been winning and had a lot of updates in the last month and you used that, right? If you Google like just the Twitter API gem in the JavaScript community, there's like six of them and they all have different approaches to how to do this thing. And again, I'm not crapping on JavaScript. That is not my point. Whatever you use to build your dreams is fine with me, right? I'm quoting a local member of our, our Ruby community, Chuck Bose, when I say that. Seriously, I love that you're out there just building stuff. I love builders. I want you to keep building. But this is kind of a lie to show this and be like, Ruby is dead. But it's a, it's a favorite trope on Orange website to say Ruby is dead over and over and over again, right? And so this year I have a plan. And you all are part of the plan now because you fell for it and you RSVP'd and you showed up tonight. So welcome to the plan. Um, this, is, this is a graph of languages to maybe avoid. Thanks to this guy whose blog you can find real easily. Um, and I dislike. And uh, the reason I dislike it is because, again, this is a lie. Like, here's the total repos. Uh, the, the percentage of monthly active users is not actually what that is. This is not the monthly active users who visit GitHub. The monthly active users who visit GitHub 
You can't tell what languages they write primarily. That's an impossible thing. It's not in our header tag, right? Like, does anyone actually like include a header that's like, I'm a Rubius? No, right? The MAU in this case stands for monthly active users. And the way that they're determining this graph is new repos created every month by Rubyists. And it is declining because we are a mature community. We've been around for 20 some odd years. And we have enough repos to do all the things. In JavaScript, by contrast, they still need more repos to do the string removal thing. We've got to get a couple more of those in there. So they're creating a lot of repos. And a lot of you are learning JavaScript in your schools, right? We have code schools all across the nation who are teaching pe people JavaScript only, period. You go to a boot camp for five or six months and you learn JavaScript and you learn React and you can get out of school and make $100,000 a year, no problem. It's a real thing. So of course the schools are following the market, right? It's also worth pointing out that the, the y-axis is the native scale of the real mm. That's an excellent point. Yeah, from 20 to zero, you could just make this real menacing if you actually embiggen, right? You're like, oh, Ruby is dead. It died yesterday. Ruby, nobody's using Ruby anymore. Yeah, except for all the companies. Actually, the top 10 YC Combinator companies. GitHub is in Rails, yeah. Twitter, that was Rails to you. So but they, they switched to Scala cleverly so that they, they could hire all seven Scala programmers on the planet. Um, <laughs> the front end is still Rails, yeah. But they're working on, on moving it over to Scala. They found another one, another <laughs> developer in Scala. So they're ready to rewrite the... the so. This, this is a lie, and that's what I wanted to look at at the end of 2020. 2020 is actually kind of a big deal for us as a community. Ruby 3 is going to be released at Christmas next year. I have it on good authority. Matt's a straight promised me that Ruby 3 is coming. And Ruby 3 is going to be three times faster than Ruby 2 was. And that means for us that we're going to have a big hype cycle. Remember that thing where I'm a marketer and a salesperson? I understand what it means, this PR thing. I know that a lot of developers, myself included some of the time, don't care at all. Like not at all interesting to us. But PR matters. We're gonna have a real big PR cycle for Ruby around Christmas of this year. We're gonna be all up and about the news. And people are gonna be benchmarking Ruby against other languages and they're gonna be like, wow, Ruby maybe is actually fast. And look at this, they have a concurrency model uh, using guilds and now they have a just-in-time compiler and on and on and on. Ruby 3 is a really big deal and it's coming this year. And I want our Ruby graph to look like this. The next time your Facebook blogs about us wants to show this graph, I want a little bit of a tick at the end. So that, that, that orange website goes to post this particular screenshot and it doesn't look as fun or good for them. And then they have to use the 2018 metrics so they can still dog on us as a community, right? I want to put this little hook on the end. And I'm going to show you how I'm going to do that real fast. Um, this is actually. In 14 minutes. I need two minutes. I'm going to take two. I'm not going to take 14. Um, to be fair, Scott, you took a bunch of my time already, so. I did it intentionally. Yeah, I believe you. I believe you would do exactly that thing. Everything that I learned about you from your presentation and up till now is just malice. Is when I think Scott Hanselman, and I think malice. So, yeah. So I made this website. You might recognize the logo. It's not a website. It's an organization on GitHub. Uh, it's called the Open Ruby Foundation. It has one contributor. It's me. There's nothing here. I'm proposing this, that we actually organize under one single banner. And I'm on the board of Ruby Together. I am meeting with some people from Ruby Central. I am meeting with some people from the Ruby Association. I propose that we make a single nonprofit organization to unify all of our efforts under a single banner. If JavaScript can do it, we can definitely do it, right? But over the last year, I watched the attendees at this meetup fall to eight people. There were eight people at the first Ruby meetup that I came to when I started getting involved again. And there were 150 at the largest that this woman in the back ran for us back in the day. And that's kind of mirroring this graph and it's not okay with me. So I want your help in getting more people here. And next time, the reason that we wanna have 100 people here 
is that I'm going to talk about this graph again for the third time. And that'll be the last time that I talk about the graph. And I promise to give a technical talk first, really interesting technical talk about deeply weird things. But I'm going to talk about the graph again, and I'll probably cry again because it really matters to me because I bought my house on the back of this language. And I bet that it matters to you. I think that Ruby probably has changed a lot of our lives, right? I'm, I'm committed to the language. I'm committed to the community. It's unique. I'm a developer advocate. I go to 40 conferences sometimes in a year. There's nothing like this, like not even close. Not even close. Every single community outside of Ruby is fractured beyond belief. We don't have the tightness and the love for each other that Ruby has had. It just doesn't exist in other language communities. We have something very special, and I'm not suggesting that it's dying. I'm suggesting that like, we have an opportunity to show the world our heart, right? And this is the year to do that thing. I think the Open Ruby Foundation is the way. I think if we can get 100 people in this room next month, 100 people is kind of a critical number where I can throw this thing up on the screen and I could be like, hey, can I have 10 minutes a week for like the next six months from every one of you? Just go and help me write this Open Ruby curriculum. And if you help me write a two week curriculum to teach people Ruby, I personally will go and pitch it to every boot camp in the country. And I would bet I close 50% of those sales. I'm a pretty good talker. I am. I'm a pretty good talker. I can talk these boot camps into teaching people an alternative language. I can talk them into teaching an open Ruby curriculum that's open source and owned forever by the community for the community. Right? And then we can get back to a place where we show this at the end of the year. Because every boot camp graduate makes a hundred repos a week, right? That is one thing I can count on my boot camp bros and babies to do with me, right? All of you together working to make this little spike at the end of Ruby, right? This is how we get there. We make that open Ruby curriculum and we're going to be fine as a community, but we got to shut down Orange website by the end of the year because we cannot afford in this next PR cycle to have them be critical of us. So next time, please, please, please bring two friends or even bring three friends. And when we get 100 people in this room, we've reached a critical mass. We can all start working on this thing together because 10 minutes a person for the 60 people that we had, that's 10 hours of work. I, I don't have another 10 minutes to work. I just heard Scott talk and realized I don't, I don't actually have an extra five minutes this week. I've got to go and clean up my office and my desk and then take those books because I'm Tsundoku. I have to take all the books off of my dresser now that I've been hoarding. Um, but I, I thank you all very much for your time. I appreciate you being here. I know you're exhausted. Please go home and enjoy your evening. I will see you next month. You have to keep coming. It's vitally important. Thank you.